Okay, the next topic, again, unit of measurements for gases, is pressure. So temperature and volume discussed the last one, pressure in this one, and all three of them are very important aspects as to how we predict how gases behave when we change one, two, or all three of those. Okay? So we hear a lot about pressure, and we talk about there's a lot of pressure on us, you get good grades, a lot of pressure on a shooter. Uh, in basketball, you've got to do a one-on-one -on -one to win the ball game for the team. I mean, there's pressure all over the place. But what does this pressure mean in science that we can apply maybe to those situations in some way? Well, the classical definition is pressure is force over area. In other words, if I were to press down on a surface, the amount of force that I press down divided by the surface area of my hand in contact with that surface, that divide, division problem will be a measurement of the pressure that I've applied to that surface, okay? Now, uh, there's different aspects of pressure. They take different approaches, but the bottom line, this is kind of it, but we don't have to necessarily use force over area to come up with our pressures. And the best way to, to look at that is in terms of air pressure, where we use a barometer to measure pressure. And a very interesting history about how the barometer was um, discovered or made. There's an Italian guy by the name of Evangelista um, Torricelli. And Torricelli said that uh, when you take your cup, like you're washing your cup or some glass or something in soapy water, and you pull that glass out, you can feel there's a tug of war between the water and the outside surface. So what's going on there? Well, uh, you have the pull, the gravitational pull of the water pulling that back in. It's also called water tension. The water does not want to break apart from the rest of the water in there, so you've got this force of gravity working on that. At the same time, you have a vacuum right there. And that vacuum is equivalent to what the pressure is outside of the glass, what we call air pressure. Okay? So if you've got them equal to each other, the pressure here is going to be equal to pressure here if you're maintaining what we call equilibrium. He thought that was a pretty cool idea, and so he thought he could come up with an idea of coming up with a way of uh, finding pressure in the atmosphere by using a liquid that isn't quite as unreliable as water. So he used something like mercury. Now mercury, unfortunately, and they didn't know it back then, mercury was a dangerous poison. Well, it still is. But they didn't know it back then. Uh, in fact, there used to be a group of people walking around in society called Mad Hatters. If you've ever seen Alice in Wonderland, you have this crazy white-haired guy um, with a hat up, um, with stuff sticking out of his hat, with like numbers and stuff. He was a hat maker. They called him hatters. And they would make their brims out of mercury. They would soak the mercury, they sit there and dab their hand there, not realizing that the mercury is going to get into their, go through the pores in their hands and into the blood vessels and carry to the brain. And the mercury all collects in the brain and drives them insane before they finally die. Okay? So, that's what happened to Evangelista. Evangelista, who discovered the barometer, uh, died because, at the age of 39 because of this. But here's what he left with us in this short time on Earth. He found that this, here's your vacuum right there. And it changed according to what the atmospheric pressure was, okay? If it was, it was cloudy, rainy, it was probably a low pressure system, although they didn't understand at the time, but we know now, meteorologists will tell you on TV, we got a low pressure system coming in, that means we got rain, okay? That meant that gap was bigger. I'm sorry, you see, low pressure. No, at least, yes, because that would drive this column down. So as this vacuum got wider, this pressure dropped the amount of mercury. So they, he measured 
the distance from the level of the mercury up to here using a one meter tube that went from, again, the top level of the mercury to the top of the tube. And he found that on an average, that it had a measurement of 760 mercury uh, millimeters. Right? So we would call that one atmosphere. That's an average day. And he said that it was equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. So yes, we use mercury in measuring with barometers. Now, they later changed that to 760 torr. I see both used interchangeably, but they named it after Tor Jelly. I'm sure he's very happy about that right now. Crazy man. It's also equal to 76.0 centimeters of mercury. And since we are, you know, not using uh, SI units, uh, we use inches. So 29.92 inches is the average for mercury, uh, for uh, an atmosphere. So these are all barometric pressures right here. And we use ATM as an abbreviation for atmosphere. So that's one way of measuring uh, pressure. It doesn't show force and it doesn't show area. We could manipulate this in such a way that it would, but we're not going to do that. It's not important. Another way is by using the classical physics version of pressure, force divided by area. And in physics, using the uh, SI uh, labels, Newton is the SI unit for force, which is one kilogram meter per second squared. And the area is meters squared. So that gives us Newtons per square meter. Now, you don't know what a square meter is, but imagine a yard and um, uh, a yard long and a yard wide. That is, and then slightly bigger than that, that is the area of a square meter, right? And we call those Pascals, named after Blaise Pascal, a Pascal triangle fan, for those of you who have dealt with Pascal's triangle. In English, we use pounds per square inch. Those of you who fill up tires or any, have dealt with a car at all know that PSI is a big deal. And most tires are filled up in the neighborhood of 30 to 32 PSIs above uh, atmospheric pressure. Um, so it turns out, because now a square inch is really small, I and mean, you have 14.7 pounds of pressure applied to a square inch. That's, that's a lot of force, okay? That's a lot of pressure on there. Now expand it to a square meter, which is bigger than a square yard, that's humongous. So if this is 14.7, this turns out to be 101,300 pascals, which they use 101.3 kilopascals. Now, I put this on here, you don't have to do this, but I'm showing you that these two are equivalent. You can convert pounds per square inch into uh, pascals by doing this process. You're not going to do any practice problems like that. But I'm showing you it's something that could be done. And it is, like I said, a force per square area. And which is why we have a lot of squares going on over there and here. So um, that's uh, your conversions that you're going to be using. There's a lot of conversions for pressure. That's why I separate it into its own entity. So you have some practice problems to do here. I'll give you five practice. There's an example. Did I use an example? I thought I had one. I did not. OK. Um, but these are all conversion problems. One atmosphere is equal to such and such number of centimeters of mercury or something like that. All right? Have fun.